worship Christ the King. Alleluia, amen. Praises to him we bring. Alleluia, amen. With grateful heart and voice, before his throne rejoice. Praise is his gracious choice. Alleluia, amen. Good morning. I just can't tell you how pleased I am with uh, your response to the kids and what they uh, shared with us uh, these last three Sundays. And uh, I, <laughs> we lost our, our young reader this morning. I know you noticed. He wanted to be on stage. He wanted to dress up. He wanted to be a participant. He, he was, uh, but I did a good job last week, he reminded me. So, said, yes, you did. You're not fired, I promise. <laughs> so that's not the reason. But it's, uh, it's good to uh, have them experience what, uh, just even a, a glimpse of what might have been felt by those who were part of the story. And uh, appreciate all those who made uh, those moments possible. I'm going to uh, read again from Matthew chapter 2. I'm going to start in the middle of verse 1 uh, and, and read the first few verses of the text that you've already heard part of. Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. I got to say a couple of things here. Uh, number one, I've, I've, uh, I, think, I know recently I've even preached that Herod was a Jew. He was not. I, uh, he was an Edomite. He's a cousin. He's not uh, actually of the 12 tribes. And um, I have always uh, saw this account with, uh, the, through the eyes, I guess, of the way we sing it. I talked about that a little bit last week. But you might remember that in the Gospel of John, one of the arguments that the Pharisees had with Jesus, uh, or the discussions they had among themselves, was we don't know where the Messiah comes from. Do you remember that text? Well, the quote of, quote, the prophet is half a verse out of Micah and half a verse out of Samuel, who you could say is a prophet, but uh, was not a clear prophecy of, uh, of Jesus being born in Bethlehem. It, it's almost as if they put their heads together to, to come up with some things that could go together to make this a reality. And I'm not trying to say that this wasn't a prophecy, but it, it kind of represents the uproar that was going on in Jerusalem. If you can imagine some guests from another country showing up in the capital city of a nation that, yes, is kind of a crossroads of humanity, but no, not known for its diversity. And they're asking around about the king, and uh, Herod, of course, isn't really the king. I'm getting ahead of myself here, but uh, he is quite upset, and so is everyone else that hears it. It says all Jerusalem with him. So uh, let, let's let's just kind of look at these uh, bearers of gifts as they've come. The the magi, wise men. Uh, that's what we call them. I've titled the lesson uh, wise men. Uh, they're not called this in the text, but. All of the work that they did to get here is all put in front of them in the words, we saw a star and we followed it. And so in, in most commentators' minds, that equates to astrology. Astronomy and astrology were pretty much the same thing because those who studied the stars were so in awe of what they were studying, they could not imagine the stars not having some bearing on our lives, and I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about that this evening in our time together in the fellowship hall. You've noticed I've studiously avoided the term three, and uh, 
we almost didn't have three wise men this morning, and I was just ready to say, we don't have to have three. Because there were three gifts, but we're not told how many people were bearing those gifts. We're not even told how many boxes of gifts there were. There may have been multiple boxes of gold or multiple boxes of frankincense and myrrh. And so it really doesn't tell us what we think it tells us to say, well, there's three different kinds of gifts here. The whole idea of these being kings, there's a song, as you might remember, that we, we traditionally sing, We Three Kings of Orient. Well, the East is right. Beyond that, uh, we're, we're kind of making it up as we go. Um, it's not stated that these are kings. It doesn't make sense that kings would leave their countries and travel to another capital city and offer these gifts, especially to another king, one who is king of the Jews. And again, I've already mentioned Herod is really not a king, but he sure liked uh, that idea, and so uh, he would wear that if they would let him. Now, the, the one thing I think that's probably closest of all of these is that we are dealing with foreigners. We are dealing with non-Jewish people. Therefore, they are Gentiles, which is actually not stated in the text. And it's possible that someone coming from afar, especially likely to be Babylon, where we know some Jews remained, uh, how else would they hear the stories uh, either from Daniel or others, who wrote about the Messiah. But uh, the likelihood is that we're dealing with Gentiles. Now, we have this star. If there's anything about this account uh, that, that has captured the imagination of everyone who reads it, it is, are you sure? <laughs> there was a star that did these things? Well, clearly, they were looking for this star. We have, we have identified his star, they told uh, Jerusalem and Herod. And for them, it signaled the coming of the Messiah. The king of the Jews is the term they use. And that, again, would be a term that you might expect coming from someone who doesn't really know uh, Old Testament Hebrew in the language. It's, of course, Jesus always referred to as the Messiah. But uh, the king of the Jews is... is owns a star, apparently, and this star is doing some things, and we have been looking for it, and we are following it. It did two things in leading the, uh, the people who came with these gifts. It led them to Jerusalem, and again, if it's the king of the Jews, where would you go but the capital city? And they pretty much stopped, apparently, really looking at what the star is doing when they got to Jerusalem, and then they realized they weren't there yet, and so they were overjoyed to go out, as we'll read in just a moment, and, and realize the star is still moving. And so the star, the text says, led them to Bethlehem, which was only five miles away. And if you can imagine looking up into the heavens at a star and thinking of it guiding you five miles, that, that, that's, that's pretty incredible. Uh, you know, what kind of star must this have been? It really does not bode well for the theory that there was a conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. That's still pretty far up there, folks. And that wouldn't take us five miles down the road. It came to rest over the house, whatever that means. And I know your imagination's probably worked for years as mine has as to what that might have looked like. But this is an incredible uh, experience by uh, people who have gone a long way to find what they found. Now, I want to <laughs> make a couple of observations about these that we call the wise men and the star, and the prophecy for that matter. You realize that Herod calls all the chief priests and scribes. He didn't call a couple of representatives. He wants them all. And there are 24 courses of priests uh, that could have been three or four dozen people conferring and answering his questions. They knew where the Christ would be born, but they sent these Gentiles on to worship first. Does that seem a little odd to you? Because it does to me. You walk into town and you tell me that the king of the Jews has been born and you've seen his star. 
and then I look up in Scripture that I know where that is, and then I go back to what I was doing? What's wrong with this picture? What, what kind of prejudice, what kind of presuppositions were made by these chief priests and scribes who were not curious enough to follow? They allowed the Gentiles to go and do the worshiping in their place. Now, the other thing that's pretty clear in this text, and I'm not going to read all of it because, frankly, it's pretty horrible. But Herod is a treacherous individual. Some say, well, we, you know, this didn't happen or we would have seen it, we would have known about it. Or he was doing stuff like this all the time and this just didn't make the news. Herod secretly called the Magi to, and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. When you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. What a lion. And he gets angry after he lies, because they don't come back, as we know. Herod doesn't follow them, but my question again is, why did the priests not follow these people with their gifts. If nothing else, to see what is going on. If nothing else, to see what they've seen. Matthew tells us about the star, and we're left to, to wonder, is, is it divine inspiration that, that Matthew knows about the star? The priests didn't apparently get into the story. They were content to be spectators. They did not follow on down to Bethlehem to find out what was going on. But the star guides the wise men to glory. And in verses 9 through 11, After hearing the king, they went on their way, and the star, which they'd seen in the east, went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. Uh, okay. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house... They saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they presented him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Frankincense doesn't come from around there. <laughs> At least Arabia and further east. Uh, myrrh, possibly gold, yes. But these gifts were, were gifts fit for a king. A and they were... Uh, excessive, expensive, and worshipful. There's, there's something going on, and we are worshiping an infant. Note that Matthew makes careful note that the child is with Mary, but that the worship is for the child. Mary's a dear woman, a, an, an amazing woman of faith. But she did not receive the worship. It was not for her. It was for Jesus. And we see the New Testament tell us over and over and over that's as it should be. So I, I want to kind of unpack this idea of worship just a little bit from what we've uh, seen in these last few verses. Worship, first of all, is something beyond us. It, it, it's for something bigger than us. We don't bother to worship the everyday, the commonplace. That, that, that's not worthy of worship. Jesus was an ordinary baby, but came through extraordinary means. And although they may not have known that, they knew that from their religion, the star was guiding them toward one who would be king. They searched the heavens to find what they found. And this put them in a frame of worship that continued for months, apparently, as they traveled the long journey from Far East. Secondly, worship is a personal presence. <laughs> I, I, I can only imagine, you know, in our day, can you imagine someone saying, oh, there's, there's a, a wonderful new king being born off in another country somewhere and, and we get the TV remote and we'd say, is it on YouTube? You know, because I'm going to sit right here in my easy chair 
Sure hope the news covers it so I can see it. There's nothing personal about that. Worship means you get out of your chair. Worship means you go where the, where the action is. Worship is personal. I wanted to see for myself. I want to say for myself. I want to sing for myself. I want to pray for myself. I, I appreciate our tradition that, that says, you know, worship isn't something that, that, that we're going to let someone else get up on stage and do for us. Uh, I'm inviting you into your own copy of your own scriptures, and I'm challenging you to look with me this morning. This is not audience spectator, and our singing is certainly not. Oh, we could have professionals, we could have multiple microphones, we could... We could wow the audience, but the audience is in heaven. And worship is personal. And if you don't sing, your seat is not occupying a worshiper. You can't just hear it around you. You can't just let someone else do it for you. It's personal. And it involves sacrifice. These people traveled at great expense themselves, stayed on the road in dangerous places, multiple nights to arrive where they arrived. And when they got there, they weren't there and they had to travel again. That not to mention the gifts themselves and the sacrifice of bringing something expensive, protecting something expensive across those miles and dangerous roads and making sure the proper recipient is the one who receives the worship. This is very personal and worship is always presented in a, in a personal light in Scripture. And thirdly, you cannot remove the idea of divine guidance from these texts. And, and it's, it gets comical to me as I read commentaries, even of deeply religious people trying to, you know, come to a text like this and say, well, you know, they probably... <laughs> it was probably just a constellation. It was probably just a conjunction of stars. It was probably some... A stellar event that occurred, you know, that of course we would have understood as just a scientific reality. Oh yeah. Yeah, stars do what that did all the time. Right. Where's the wonder? Where's the awe? That's the worship word. There's divine guidance going on here. And, and I've mentioned that these are Gentiles and I, I think maybe that has not set fully with us. Maybe we would have had the same reaction as the priests. You know, you may think you're following something, but we know God and, you know, we'll go with what we know. <laughs> Sad. Sad. Because God has chosen to go beyond our number and beyond our walls throughout history. Abraham, remember, was a wandering Aramean. God made him into a nation. And as you go on, the story of Ruth, the story of others throughout the Old Testament and New Testament is, is dotted all along the way with those who weren't part of the in crowd in the original group. But God took the time to speak to them too. As He sent Jonah to Nineveh. As He called on Israel to be a light to the nations. As Jesus sent His disciples into all the world, to every creature. Divine guidance is what happens when a heart looks into the heavens and seeks the ways of the Creator. And if they didn't hear that from you and me, it's because we didn't speak. It doesn't mean they can't hear. And these gift bearers listened and worshipped and allowed, in this case, a star driven by the creator of the stars to guide them where they should go. And they made it to the right place. They made it to the Messiah's doorstep, the house where he was currently living. Divine guidance is what you seek when you want to please someone that you admire. We, we admire God. We want to do what God wants. We talk about the way we do worship, and, and no, it's, it's got its quirks and, and, and uniqueness. But it's as we understand the way He wants it. 
And so we don't, we don't do it because we saw it on TV or we don't do it because we thought it was a great idea. We do things because God has asked for us to do things. God has asked for us to gather. God has asked for us to make it personal. God has asked us to be participants. He's asked us to lift up and to bow down both as acts of worship. And in His guidance, He's trying to show us how to approach Him. And remember... As an all-consuming fire, approaching God in the wrong way has historically been a life and death matter. And thankfully, he takes the time to say, you know, if you do it my way, you won't get burned. Because it's pretty awesome to be in the presence of Almighty God. So seek His ways. Now the text is uh, moves to... The rest of the story, I guess, as Paul Harvey would say, the protection, I think, I want to call us to, the way God did not stop as He got the the gift bearers to the Savior. And so verses 13 uh, through 15, Now when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. There was to fulfill, this was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. A text once used for the Exodus uh, under Moses' hand, now applied to the Messiah. Well, as you, as you look at what went on here, it's clear that God is not finished, though the wise men are gone. They go another way, but God knows what Herod's going to be like. And God says, Joseph, you've got to get out of Bethlehem. You've got to go clear to Egypt. There may have been thousands of Jews living in Egypt at this time. There, uh, there was quite a colony, particularly in Alexandria. This was not completely unusual, but it certainly was unusual for someone who has just had a child and been around long enough to have some guests come from out of country. But the aspects of protection as we see in this text, God wants to make sure Joseph knows what the threat is. I I know sometimes we, we look at our kids and we say, you know, get up and come in here and we don't want to tell them why. And they say, why? And we say, you know, you need to do what I say, whether you understand or not. Well, I, I thank God that God gives us a little more than that. You know, God, God tells us some things we should stay away from and He tells us why. And, and He gives us that information. He tells Joseph, you know, you need to leave. This is pretty, this is pretty major, Right? Herod is going to destroy this child. Well, that's all he has to know. Uh, How far do I have to go? Well, going to Egypt. All right, let's go. Let's go right now. God made known what the threat that Joseph would be facing had he stayed there. And Joseph listened to his dream. Secondly, the threat is enumerated But the action is clear, go to Egypt. And Joseph makes the interpretation, now would be a good time. And so he gets up in the night and goes. He acts quickly. Protection is one of those things, you know, if it's dangerous where I'm standing, how long do you want to wait on the danger to arrive before you move? Now I know some of us are, you know, kind of daring and, uh, willful, and uh, you know, we might see how long we got. Maybe watch the watch a little bit, time it out, you know, play games with danger. We'll come back to that. Joseph says, There's a, a, a danger of my child being destroyed. Now's a good time. We're out of here. And they go to Egypt. And thirdly, as they leave for Egypt, the instructions have not ceased. As the chapter unfolds, and I'm not going to read every verse in the chapter, it it continues to tell how Joseph kept listening to what God had to say. Now in Matthew 1 and 2, there are three instances where an angel 
spoke to Joseph in a dream. And there's another instance, the final one, where it just says he was warned in a dream. We're not told that it was angelic. But I suppose by the fourth time, Joseph is kind of accustomed to paying attention. He continued to listen. And he knew when it was time to come back, and he knew when he got back that Herod's son was on the throne. Maybe this isn't a great time to come to this particular place. We'll just move north and go to Nazareth. And so he does. The protection was continual. And the, the continual protection was based on continual listening. And so Joseph wants to stay close to God. If God is going to cause this child to be born, if God is going to save the world, if God is going to protect this child, then God's going to tell me when to move. And I want to stay tuned to God. Not the local political broadcast, not the news, not any of the other things that might distract from the Heavenly Father. And so they went. 1 Timothy chapter 6 is a verse that uses this same word, flee. And uh, there's three occasions in the New Testament that, that don't talk about fleeing using the word like it is with Joseph going to Egypt. The first is flee immorality, Paul told the Corinthians. The second is flee idolatry, again, Paul told the Corinthians. And in this instance, flee from these things, Paul told Timothy. These things include the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. The action of fleeing is dramatic. We wander into the state where we find ourselves without faith. We wander into sin. We stay out of sin by acting decisively and moving now. And, and, and again, that's a, that's a text that's used multiple times in the New Testament. It's something we need to cultivate within ourselves because we, we get this lackadaisical attitude that we're pretty good and we're pretty tough and we're pretty mature and we're pretty whatever we are. And what we turn out to be is pretty foolish because hanging around the wrong thing too long gets us in trouble. And some things we ought to just move away from right now. That's just the right response. But also realize that there are things to pursue. And so I want to take us to, the, to this final point, and that is that God wants to be pursued. You know, goodness and righteousness and gentleness and all those things that were mentioned in that passage are all descriptions of what God is and what God brings to our lives. God wants us to get on our camels and go across the desert and find what He wants us to find. He doesn't, he doesn't want us to, to be lackadaisical and put it off and wait till later and all those other things we tend to do. He wants us to be hot in pursuit of Him and His glory. And the companion reality is that as we move toward God, we are taken further away from danger. The, the effort of going toward God, by definition, takes us away from evil. We're not going to find the evil surrounding God. We're not going to find temptation from God. God isn't going to lead us into something that's going to cause us harm. And so as we pursue God, we're going to find ourselves leaving danger behind. If I could summarize these points, and I think I need to. This lesson is pretty broad, I suppose. I want to ask the question, are you wise? Are you pursuing? And that means following Him. Looking for Him. Seeking Him. Other words that are used in Scripture to talk about that. 
Are you worshiping Him? And, and that involving sacrifice. Is there some movement on your part when it comes time to worship Him? Is there some gifts on your part when it comes time to worship Him? God wants us to be in awe of Him. But that awe stretches beyond Him to those also who are around. And thirdly, are you willing to take protective action? I, I actually wrote this point twice. The first time I wrote it, I put be protected. And I thought, no, that's not the point of the text. I mean, we can sit around all day and say, Lord, protect me today. Lord, protect me today. Sure hope I don't run into anything today that I can't handle. Well, God wants a little more responsibility out of us than that. God doesn't want to just protect us and we're stay ignorant of everything. God wants us to take the protective action. God wants us to listen to Him. Sometimes run away from the things that we've decided to be around. And, and so it's an active response on our part. As active as worship is and as active as pursuit is. Protection is available. But are you willing to take evasive action? That's important. I want to offer... Uh, the Lord's invitation as we close this series because it seems very clear to me that the whole story of Jesus coming to the earth is the story of God wanting to be near us. But you know the way you can tell whether someone that you want to be around wants to be around you? Which way are they moving? And I'm inviting you to come into His presence. This morning, I'm inviting you to come toward God. And if you've been moving away or being stationary, it's, it's time to move toward. And if we can help you in any part of that process, we're here to do that. And we invite you to come now while we stand and sing. Come worship Christ the King. Alleluia. Amen.